Good evening. I wasn't sure if we we're going to have any announcements beforehand, but it looks like we're not. So we'll get started. <laughs> uh, number 496 for your first song tonight. 496. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels back at me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels back at me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels back at me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I have a loving Savior up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I with him stand. He's waiting now for me in heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land will live eternally. The saints on every hand are chanting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Song before the prayer and scripture reading will be number 420, 420. Mm. Once I stood in the night with my head bowed low. In the darkness as black as could be, and my heart felt alone, and I cried, Oh Lord, don't hide your face from me. 
Would you bow with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for another day of life that you've blessed us with. And such a beautiful day outside that we're able to see all the wonders of your creation and appreciate the time that we have with one another. Lord, as we gather here at this time, we ask that our, that our minds be in the right place, that we do our best to block out all the distractions from the outside world, and we focus on exactly why we're here. And with that mindset, Lord, for every song that we sing and the words that we hear in the lesson tonight, we hope that we do so in a way that we can apply it in our daily lives, that we can see a little bit more of your wisdom and to truly increase in our faith, not only for ourselves, but so that we can be example, an example to others. Lord, as we continue on through this week following tonight's service, we ask that you be with us and grant us courage that we may be able to not just feel at home in this place, but also be able to kind of share those things with those around us, to take those opportunities when they arise, and to realize that there is no shame in the gospel. Ask God that we do all things in a way that is good representation of you and your son. And when we fall short, help us to recognize those things and turn away from those things. And each day and each breath we take, Lord, we have to remember that those things are gifts from you. And let us never take one of them for granted. We thank you, Lord, so much for the opportunity that we have at this time to worship you. Let us do all things in a way you find well-pleasing. It's in Jesus' name we pray now. Amen. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Matthew 6, 19 through 24, and this is the New King James Version. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light is in you, is, is darkness, and how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Cannot serve God and mammon. Number 477. 477. If you're able to, please stand. Our souls not treasures, but perish with using. However precious they be. Yeah, there's a country to which I am going. Heaven is all to me. Heaven is all to me. Brighter its glory will be. Joy without measure will be my treasure. Heaven
on following the lesson will be number 560, 560. Before we begin our study this evening, I want to mention that next Sunday evening, Andy Baker will be here. I said Andy, not Randy. Andy Baker, who is president of World Christian Broadcasting. He's been with us in the past and spoken about that work and uh, will be returning to do that again. It's one of those fascinating areas where for a relatively small amount of money, the gospel can be preached to literally several billion, two or three billion souls in China, behind the Iron Curtain, and uh, in most of Africa and uh, South America. And we've had uh, the opportunity to be a part of that work in the past, and he's coming simply to let us know how things are continuing to progress, and uh, I'm sure if your schedule is free that you'll want to be here and uh, hear what Handy has to sh say about World Christian Broadcasting via typical Sunday evening assembly, with the only exception I won't be speaking and Harry won't be speaking, but Andy will, and uh, I hope that you'll be able to be present. Our study tonight continues the focus on the Sermon on the Mount, and we are in chapter 6, looking at the section from verse 19 through 24. And I apologize for the fact that uh, the first slide is extremely difficult to read, especially uh, the upper section. It looks great. If you all want to turn around and look at the television, it just looks really well there. But it doesn't appear very bright on this screen, and I tried not to use any red at all, but this is a hard thing to illustrate, and I didn't know how to even approach it. This caught my attention, and it looks great here. Uh, it doesn't look so hot behind me, but uh, we'll just not dwell on that, and I'll go to the next slide, or I will try to go to the next slide. And I now know that it's not batteries that... Uh, interferes with our clicker at times. It's something else, and I don't have a clue what it is, but there it works. You hit it hard enough, and it eventually does what it's supposed to do. That works with things, not with people, by the way. So don't be hitting anybody. You didn't get that from me tonight. But if you want to hit your computer once in a while, it may actually do some good. The focus of this section is on money and the Christian's relationship to it. And so I've, I've highlighted this first section under the heading, uh, the focus of your life, what is it? In our world, and I think this has been pretty well true for most of human civilization, we measure a man's worth or success, and by man I'm speaking in the generic sense of man or woman, we measure his or her success by what he or she accumulates, how much money or possessions they have, and if they're great, we consider them great, and if they are meager, sadly, we often don't pay a great deal of attention to them. But when you look at Scripture, you find an entirely different approach. And so I, I want to look at the text one more time from the perspective of what Jesus is saying here on the mountaintop as he addresses some of the most important matters that are addressed throughout Scripture. It is essentially a formula for living the abundant life that he came to provide. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. It's pretty clear cut. The goal of life is not the accumulation of things. You may remember the statement Jesus made in Luke 12, verse 15. It is 
the result of a request that was brought to our Lord. Apparently, two sons are in a dispute over the family inheritance. When one says to the Lord, in essence, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. And Jesus immediately refused to get involved. And in refusing to intervene, he says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses, the exact opposite of what nearly everybody in this world believes. And so this is an issue that I think has tremendous relevance. Jesus is not, however, warning so much against the accumulation of things, but our trust in them. But it's hard to separate the two. There is nothing wrong with possessing things as long as those things don't possess us. That's the point that Jesus was making because these things offer no real security, whatever they might be. In the case of our Lord's message and the analogy that he draws here, wealth in the first century was essentially identified in relationship to metals, precious metals like gold and silver, and even closets, how much clothing we possess. You know, I think every time I open the door to a closet, I can't get my clothes in one closet, so I have two and they're both stuffed. I am extremely wealthy by the Lord's own standards. And I don't want to ever forget that. God has blessed me way more than I deserve. And I must pledge to him that I will not make those blessings, however, the focus of my life. Because they are, no matter what they are, temporary in nature. They simply do not last. And so Jesus is saying to us, do not put your trust in uncertain riches. Wealth is easily lost. Treasures are subject to decay. Your clothes may become moth-eaten. Your valuables may be tarnished. They may lose their worth. And of course, we're not in any way suggesting that gold or silver are subject to rust. Jesus is simply speaking in a way that people can understand. It doesn't matter what precious metal you may possess. It ultimately won't buy any of the things that really matter in life. So why become so enamored by them. I want to share with you very quickly a list of 20 things that money cannot buy. And I wonder if we were to make our own list, if our list would compare favorably with the one I'm about to share with you. Money cannot buy happiness. I believe that all of us would like to be happy every day. But I will tell you, I find nothing in Scripture that would indicate that that is what God wants us to be. I hear people trying to justify things in their lives by saying, it makes me happy and I know God wants me to be happy, so it must be right. But the Bible doesn't tell us that God wants us to be happy. It does tell us over and over and over again that He wants us to be holy. Happiness is a byproduct of holiness. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, John 10.10. 10. But that abundant life comes only when we live as God calls us to live as his people. And that can't be purchased in the hardware store. Money won't buy us time. Time is one commodity that no matter who you are, you get at the same rate everyone else does, a second at a time. Everyone's day is filled with 24 hours. You can't add to it. No matter how much you possess, you cannot increase the amount of time that is yours. What you do with it, now that is up to you, and thus the scriptures admonish Christians to redeem the time, Ephesians 5.16, in essence, use the time well. Money won't buy us love. There have been many who have tried, 
but it doesn't work. It, fellas, doesn't really matter how much you spend on the engagement ring. It's no guarantee of a successful marriage. There have been many marriages that have fallen apart where the bride has received from the groom a tremendously valuable diamond ring. But it doesn't mean that they love each other and build a relationship that will last. That can't be bought. It can be achieved, but not with money. Not only does it not buy love, it doesn't buy health. It can buy medical advice and treatment, but in reality, the best we can do is to live a long life that will ultimately come to an end in death for all of us, no matter how much we spend on medicines and doctors. I am always struck by the woman with the issue of blood. When she approached Jesus, she was determined, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. She had reached her limit because she had spent all her income on doctors who did her no good. Well, I'm pretty close to some doctors and have been very close to doctors, but there are limits to what they can do. Yes, money can buy you medicine, but it can't buy you good health. It can't buy you true friendship. I'll just go through this list. It can't buy you good manners or confidence or trust or inner peace or family or loyalty or inner beauty. It might, I guess, be able to provide some outer beauty for a while, but no matter how much you invest, even that will fade or you will become freakish, as some have demonstrated through the many procedures that they have undergone. Can't buy us a positive, positive attitude or respect or so many other things. I, I think you get the drift. When you look at that list or the one probably that you would make yourself, you will realize that all of the things that really matter cannot be purchased. And our well-being spiritually and eternally, does not hinge on how much we have. So why, Jesus is asking, do we put so much focus on it in this world? Everything that comes our way, no matter how valuable it is monetarily, we will leave behind when we leave for eternity. So make sure that your focus is where it ought to be. Any other focus will lead to failure. Look at verse 20. He continues, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. When I read that, my question is, how in the world do I lay up treasures in heaven? I know how to lay up treasures on earth. You can put it in the bank. You can invest it in the stock market. You can hide it under your mattress and accumulate that way. But again, as he's already said, those possessions are not nearly as valuable as we are led to believe. The possessions that we need to be laying up are the ones that ensure for us a place in the eternal city come judgment day. How do you do that? I think that what we studied from the first 18 verses of Matthew 6 gives some insight as to how we go about laying up treasures, not on earth, but in heaven. By learning to be generous and sharing the blessings that God has given us. That's what alms deeds that Jesus spoke of in the first few verses of Matthew 6 really addressed, and as I told you, from those first 18 verses, Jesus is reminding us that whenever we put the emphasis on self at the expense of Savior, we do so to our own detriment. Self-promotion is self-destructive. The Apostle Paul closed his first letter to Timothy with these words. 
He had just told Timothy earlier that the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And now he says through the Apostle Paul, as for the rich in this present age, and I consider myself among that number. I don't have uh, tremendous financial resources, but I have more than I need. God has blessed me. And let's be honest, can't we pretty much all say that we're in the same boat, so to speak. We don't go to bed hungry unless it's by choice. We don't have too much trouble finding something to wear every day. We live in air-conditioned homes in the summer and heated homes in the winter. We have it really well, especially in comparison to much of the world, but we don't always consider ourselves rich. Shame on us. But to the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, which is exactly what Jesus had said in Matthew 6, but on God, this is where our hope ought to reside, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, that is, those like you and me who have been so richly blessed. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. That's what alms or doing good is all about. That's why the way Christians are called to live. Thus, we store up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So if you want to know how to store up those treasures that cannot be stolen or destroyed, it begins by using God's blessings. And every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above, as James acknowledged in his epistle, not to be hoarded, but to be shared. And when you share those blessings, what does God ultimately do? Bless us with even more. I can remember when I was 21 years old and began my first work as a full-time preacher. I look back on those days and, quite frankly, wonder how we survived. I am not in the preaching business for the money that's there to be made. Tremendously. That has not always been the case, but had I been looking for money, I would have looked in a different direction. And I thought, what am I going to do? How am I going to raise a family? How am I going to educate my children? But you know something? It happened. And it happened not because I'm such a wonderful saver and financial planner and have created uh, such wonderful savings and investment and retirement accounts. It's not because I've made tons and tons of money. It's because God has blessed me. And he's promised the same to you. And we can say with the psalmist, I've been young, now I'm old. One thing I have not seen, the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God keeps his word, but he expects us to keep our focus and to lay up treasures that really last by doing good and sharing those blessings, by being men and women of prayer who count on him and not on ourselves. The older I get, the more frequently I pray that God will help me Walk by faith, not by sight. Because when we walk by sight, we think it's all on our shoulders. Everything is up to us. But when we walk by faith, we count on God to meet our needs. And that is not to say that he doesn't expect us to do what we can where we are with what we have, but he's promised to bless those efforts. And our needs will be met. He never promised us everything we want. And when I say that, I always feel compelled to repeat the Chinese proverb, give a man and a hog everything they want, and you end up with a good hog and a bad man. I believe that's still true. God knows what we need, 
we tend to focus on what we want. If only we could turn that around and forget about what we want and just focus on our needs, we may be surprised at just how generous and abundantly God's blessings flow. But if we put our focus elsewhere, that's not going to be the case. In essence, what we're dealing with here is a matter of priorities. Look at verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you look at a person and watch them very carefully for very long, it doesn't take too much intelligence to figure out what matters in that person's life. I enjoy visiting in homes and even visiting uh, in businesses and being in the offices of people in positions of authority and just looking at what they hang on their walls and the pictures that are on display. When I see a wall that's just covered with accolades of what I've done and what I've achieved and how I've been rewarded, I frankly am not very impressed. But when I see a wall filled with pictures of the family and vacations that they've taken, things that they've done together, here's somebody that, in my judgment, has their head on straight. Because in the end, when life is about to come to its close and we look back, the things that we're going to remember with the greatest fondness are not going to be built around our work not around our responsibilities in civic institutions. I'm not opposed to good civic organizations. I'm not opposed to Civitan, the Lions, the Rotary. But I will tell you, that's not where life really is to be lived. The focus needs to be on people, the people we are in constant contact with, who matter most to us who make the memories that last. There's where our priorities ought to be. So heavenly pursuits ought to have priority, not the pursuits that the world seems so enamored by. When I think about the world and what really drives folks, folks today, it, it's money, power, fame, sex. But I read scripture and I can't find any focus on those things, but many warnings regarding each. Where is your heart tonight? I think most of the problems we face individually and collectively as a society are heart problems. We just don't bring to life the attitude that it demands and deserves. Solomon said, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. And you know I'm not talking about the blood pump here. I'm talking about that part of us that is unique and special given to us by God himself that comes when we acknowledge that we are made in his image. In many ways, the, the biblical heart addresses what we would call today the mind. And please know there is a distinction between our brains and our minds. If I had to communicate to you the difference or distinction, that mind that we possess that is God-given and made in his image, that is our very essence where our will and conscience and intellect and emotions and those kinds of things reside. That's us. Our brains are the mechanism that God, the creator of our bodies, designed to enable that part of us made in his image to interact with the physical realm. Because he is a spiritual being and someday... By his grace, we will as well be spiritual beings. That part of us made in his image will live on apart from this physical body. And it's that area of our nature and existence 
that needs to be remade. As a man think, thinketh in his heart, the King James says, the modern language, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And Jesus himself said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when you look at all the sins that characterize society, where do they originate? In bad hearts. So put your focus where it needs to be. And if you need a heart transplant, get one good news is that it's always possible to change. To take that heart that is filled with sin and devoid of God and focused on the world and lay it aside and replace it with the good heart, the good spirit, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. And then Jesus continues talking about these divided allegiances that so often develop by speaking about the eye as the lamp of the body. Verse 22. If, he says, your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If in the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. This section, if you were to outline it, has three sets of pairs or couples. Not P-E-A-R-S, but P-A-I-R-S. If you're following along, there are two kinds of treasures, earthly and heavenly. Earthly's down here, heavenly's up there. Sometimes I get confused, Michael. You ever get confused? You point up and you lean down? Yeah, I do. There are also two kinds of eyes, if you continue to read here. There's the eye that's full of light and the eye that's full of darkness. One eye works fine. When the eye works fine, the whole body is well. If the eye is full of darkness, then all bets are off. And it's probably good to stop and, and say to you to understand this particular comparison that the eye full of light was understood in the Hebraic world as a light, uh, an eye that's clear and single in purpose. The one full of darkness or the bad eye represented that which was stingy, greedy, and evil. Did you ever hear about somebody getting the evil eye or the stink eye? This is the kind of concept that Jesus is describing here. And he says, you have a choice. You have a choice between laying up treasures in heaven that will last or treasures on earth that will be lost. You have a choice be between having a single eye and a single purpose or having a, a, a dark eye, a black eye, a stingy eye that will keep you from God and the things of God. And then, this section concludes with a warning that I am confident you are familiar with. No one can serve two masters. I read that and I'm reminded of the Bible school teacher who asked in her Bible class of young students, why can a man only have one wife? And the youngster thought for a moment and said, because a man can only have one master. He can't have two. I don't think that was Owen, but it sounds like something Owen might say. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The King James says mammon. That's a transliteration of an Aramaic word that means wealth. It is an either-or process. It cannot be both. And we choose. Who will we serve? Who will be our master? The Apostle Paul in his Roman letter reminds his readers that we're all slaves. I know that's not a term that we like to even use in 
21st century America, but it encapsulates the relationship that we have in this world either to our Lord or to the God of this world, Satan. We're under the reign and rule of one or the other, and we get to choose. I can't for the life of me explain why anyone would choose to be the slave of Satan over being the slave or servant of our Lord. But that's what we do every day. We choose whom we will serve. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What we sow, we reap. This is how Paul concluded his letter to the churches of Galatia. In Romans 6, 16 through 18, he said, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered unto you, being then made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. And Jesus is saying to his folks on that mountaintop, as I'm saying to you tonight, we choose. We will choose and have chosen whether we lay up earthly treasures or heavenly treasures. We choose whether our eye will be full of light or darkness. And we choose whether we will serve God or the God of this world. And it's clear to me, but sadly not to most, <laughs> that there's only one right choice. And that's to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. I thought the best way to wrap up our brief discussion of Matthew 6, 19 through 24, was to share with you the reading of 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Probably a passage of scripture that you know by heart, certainly one that we should know by heart. John wrote for our Lord, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Love is a good thing when properly focused, but when we love the wrong things, it's extremely destructive. You see, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we're not talking about this globe. He's not saying that we should live in disdain of God's creation. He's not saying that we should be, shouldn't be conscientious and recycle and not litter and not misuse what God has given us. That's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about is being so enamored by what we see and by what we can experience of a physical nature that we lose sight of what really matters. So, love not the world nor the things that are in the world. And then he says, for all that is in the world. What are you talking about, John? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Now, if you are a Bible student, you go back to Genesis 3 and you will discover that these are the very things that led to sin's introduction. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. It'll make you wise, the devil said, to eat this fruit. It's beautiful to behold, wonderful to look upon. And if you eat, you'll be like God, the pride of life. And then you go all the way through the Old Testament and you come to Matthew chapter 4 and you see Jesus in the wilderness after 40 days of fasting and prayer. And what is the first thing that Satan says? Cast, or rather, turn these stones into bread. In fact, those three temptations fall under the same heading. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eye. From the temple, he could see all of this wonderful world. It's yours. Some would say, well, did the devil have the right to make such a bargain with the master? Well, he is, after all, the god of this world, according to the Apostle Paul in his letter to the saints at Corinth. He could have given Jesus everything, but Jesus would have nothing if he had given in. 
And we would have less than nothing because we would be without a Redeemer, a Savior, without hope. And when he said, you can cast yourself down and the, the angels will deliver you, the pride of life. Of course, Jesus did not give in to the temptation. The point is, neither should we. You see, all that is in the world, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Father, the will of God, abides forever. What do you want? A few short years of what the devil has to offer or eternity in the presence of God. You really decide when you decide where your treasure will be in heaven or on earth. When you decide whether you'll have an eye full of light or one of darkness or whether you'll serve God or wealth. And it's not a one and done decision, folks. It's a decision we make every day when we're confronted by the temptations of this world. Some days I think it's easy to make the right choices. And others it can be extremely difficult. But make the right choice nonetheless. And you'll never regret it. To give in to the wiles of the devil regret that forever. I know this is a message that is needed. As I mentioned last Sunday night, when you go through the Gospels and look at the focus of our Lord's ministry and the things that he taught, this subject of money and wealth and covetousness is addressed more than any other single issue because, it, in my judgment, is the one that will cost most folks their souls eternally. I don't want to be among that number who are lost forever. Do you? So I want to make sure I lay up treasures that can be stolen or corrupted and have an eye that's full of light and purity and serve God rather than wealth. That's my choice today. I pray I will continue to make it every day. What choice have you made? And if not the right one, is it time to change? You think about that as we sing the following hymn, and if we can help you in your obedience to the gospel, you let it be known by coming and stating your desire from a heart of faith with a willingness to repent of sins, to confess the Savior, be buried in a watery grave and raised to walk in newness of life. It's not where it ends, though. That's where it starts for now. You will make sure that your treasures are heavenly, that your purpose is spiritual and eternal, and that you serve God and not wealth. If we can help you, let us know right now as we stand and sing.
closing song will be number 350. this down before I forget it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roger, for another excellent message. As Roger uh, gave us that lesson and mentioned the idea of stink eye, it occurred to me that Aubrey, the, one of the children that uh, Janetta watches, she has mastered that at the age of two. She doesn't say a whole lot of different phrases, but she has mastered that skill. You know when she's not happy with you. A few announcements to share with you. Among our sick, Terry Bard Baldwin, that's Carla's sister, has been in the hospital dealing with a blood clot issue. Uh, Don Becker is now at home. Carolyn Majors was in the hospital and is now home. Ruth Daly is scheduled to return home from Waterview Point on June 22nd. She enjoys cards and visits, so if you have the opportunity to do either or both, she is in room 302 at Waterview Point. John Love is scheduled to have surgery June 22nd at OSU, and Mildred McLean, that's Dorothy Wilkinson's sister, uh, was taken to Memorial this morning. For those of you who are members of the Finance Committee, a reminder that you will be meeting this evening immediately after services. That will be in the multi-purpose room on the kitchen side, and that includes the deacon. If you'd like to participate in the Women's Care uh, center baby bottle campaign, uh, the fundraiser. Uh, you can still find a few bottles out there on the table near the glass door. Uh, if you would put in whatever monetary donation you'd like to provide to that effort, uh, please have those bottles turned into the office by June 27th. That'd be next Sunday. Those who took part want to thank this evening Tim Wells for leading our singing, Michael Morgan for filling in on the prayer, the opening prayer, uh, John Dollison for our scripture reading. Uh, Dennis will be uh, covering the Lord's table for those who need to this evening. And Paul Jacoby will have our closing prayer. Invite you back to every opportunity you have to join us. Our next one will be Wednesday evening at 7 when we consider, continue our summer series. And then, of course, next Sunday at 9 a.m. for study and 10 o'clock for worship. If you were not able to partake of communion this morning, it has been prepared. As we sing the final song, please exit through the rear of the auditorium. Go up the ramp into the multi-purpose room on the front side of the building, and Dennis will meet you there uh, to provide that service. And lastly, the Mid-Ohio Valley Lectureship will be uh, conducted this Wednesday through Friday at the Ohio Valley University campus. Their theme is Rebuild, Renew, and Revive. So if you'd like more details on that, there are flyers for that uh, offering out in the lobby. Number 350, 350. If you're able to, please stand. Mm -hmm. For holiness give me more striving within, more patience and suffering, more sorrow for sin, more faith in my sin.
Dear God, thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. And we know we've had an absolutely beautiful day. Help us also to remember that even in our country, there's lots of drought, a lot of people that are dealing with that, lots of flooding, the people are dealing with that, just many things that are happening. Just help us to be thankful and to be helpful in any way we can and to be, to be aware of those people. Dear God, we thank you for the, the lesson today, tonight from Roger, and help us to remember to focus on God. Dear God, we also thank you for the many blessings you've given us. Help us to remember them every day. Help us to remember the sick, and we know you always are there, but we always ask you for help in those people dealing with their illnesses. And God, now we pray that you will be with us and help us to be a light to the world around us this week as we leave this building. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.